Uh, good evening and welcome to another uh, Tuesday night lecture uh, brought to you by the Mid-Ulster Amateur Radio Club. Uh, we meet every second and fourth Tuesday here on Zoom and uh, you can also catch us on our YouTube channel www.youtube.com forward slash M-U-A-R-C media. Uh, this evening we have Murray with us. I'm going to ask him to give himself a wee introduction uh, just shortly before we pass over to him. Uh, but uh, if this is your first time uh, catching us on the YouTube or uh, with us here tonight, you're more than welcome and we hope you enjoy the content and uh, come back for another few of our lecture series. Uh, so uh, Murray, I'm going to ask you to uh, if you want to unmute yourself there and uh, you can uh, say hello and uh, uh, give us a wee bit of introduction. What's your call sign? What do you do? And uh, then it'll be completely over to yourself. Okay, so <clears throat> good evening to uh people who I've never seen before, but also a couple of colleagues who I've certainly seen or corresponded with as well. So uh, F Philip uh, Hosey in particular has uh, often said I should uh, pop over at some point and uh, given that Ryanair's a bit risky uh, at the moment <laughs> in the news, I thought I'd uh, stick to Zoom this time. It seems the safer option. So uh, G6JYB licensed uh, right on the very busiest exam ever that City and Guilds uh, had in the uh, early 1980s. Then uh, went off to do the day job and uh, over time, obviously came back into the hobby, formally volunteered as a microwave manager. No nowadays it's Spectrum Forum Chair and we'll, we'll explain more about that when I uh, put up a couple of slides. But uh, Briefly, within the uh, RSGB organisation, the Spectrum Forum covers quite a wide remit, but uh, anything from Spectrum, which is your frequency allocations, through licensing matters with Ofcom, all the way down to things like band plans, but uh, also things like propagation beacon licensing in conjunction with PSC and a few other things. So the variety of stuff we get is quite interesting. The uh, we, we are the lead group who interact with the IARU, the International Amateur Radio Union as well. So uh, some of my time, if COVID wasn't uh, limiting us somewhat, would be on uh, dealing with international affairs uh, on, on behalf of uh, all UK amateurs, as it were, along with uh, three or four other key volunteers who uh, work with me. So uh, I, I do a lot of local amateur radio when I've got the spare time left. So, so uh, I'm secretary to a repeater group. I'm a member of Chelmsford Amateur Radio Society. So I, I live down in uh, Essex in uh, England, but originally came from uh, Manchester. And uh, so had a roundabout route to there via York University as well. So but been around the place a few years, not often on uh, HF, apart from uh, special events tend to support my club on higher bands. Uh, because the, the garden and antennas are a bit limited uh, physically where I live. But uh, I'll leave that for now whilst uh, you, you just do any other intros and rounds. And then I've literally got three slides to, to just kick off what I hope will be more of a Q&A discussion. So, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, no problem at all, Murray. Um, yeah, thank you very much uh for that introduction there we're looking forward to it we do have a couple of questions uh already uh, uh entered before uh oh, so, yeah. so uh but if anyone watching us here this evening in the zoom has any questions you can put them in the chat uh, if you don't want to ask them yourselves i'll ask them on your behalf or once we get to the q a session uh you'll be able to unmute yourselves uh, and ask murray directly anything around the the spectrum and uh those difficult questions you always wanted to know the answer to absolutely feel free to ask away and and murray i believe you're gonna just talk us maybe a wee bit about the the, the survey or highlight the survey as well so um yeah I'll, I'll mention that in a little while yes absolutely so uh with that being said over to you Right, so the uh, next interesting thing is I need to share a screen here. I think 
you should Ted. hopefully be seeing yep. slideshow mode. Yep, that's us. Yeah, Charlie Good. So, the, I'm not counting this slide, so this is my <laughs> intro. Uh, so, uh, the, it's, the, the title is a little bit of a pun. So, spectrum matters, but spectrum really does matter. Because uh, if you think about it, one of the phrases to take away, and I don't claim originality for this, uh, one of my predecessors basically said, without frequencies, there is no amateur radio. Okay. So, uh, yes, if there was nothing left in your frequency schedule because it's all sold off or someone's put too much noise in there, then, uh, yes, the hobby would be a bit limited. So over time, there's, there's always been something in RSGB to either defend, acquire or manage the frequencies. Once upon a time, there was a, an HF committee, a VHF committee and a microwave committee in the days when uh, there was plenty of volunteers in the 60s and 70s and probably a lot less pressure on things obviously no internet or mobile phone companies in those days anyway as uh, things got tighter and various other things happened that was amalgamate the individual committees disappeared and it was amalgamated under a single spectrum chair that the managers you know hf vhf microwave and also uh, the the monitoring system so so if you ever hear reports about intruder watch which is uh, where IARU volunteers or RSGB volunteers in our case monitor intrusions from other services into the bands particularly like radars on HF for example that that's uh, sort of comes in to my group but the the other unusual thing about uh, the spectrum forum in RSGB is it's got direct representation from outside groups. So AMSAT UK, UK Micro Group, CDXC. The, the, if you look on the RSGB website, it lists, uh, I think, nearly 10 of those uh, special interest groups. And uh, we, we manage a few awards uh, for them each year as well. So in addition to all the dry stuff, it gives us access to an, an awful lot of skilled volunteers in uh, various places. We uh, don't normally appear at Hamfest. We're, we'll occasionally show ourselves at conventions, but uh, it, it's too big apart from one meeting a year, really. So I've been in the role, I can't remember now, five or six years. Before that, as I say, I was microwave manager. And uh, the following three slides cover the, the role we have. So, so we are not only duty bound to uh, either protect or do something up high uh, level up often with Ofcom but uh, sometimes with others at frequency allocation level the uh, there's uh, as I'll show on one of the slides in a little while it covers all the levels so spectrum at the very top then uh, license conditions and interacting with Ofcom on those although uh, not as much on EMF so if you want to bother me about that one <laughs> that, that's more of an emc committee thing but it's obviously just altered your license condition uh, and then when, when you get to using this stuff I, I effectively am the owner for the band plan so each year around about christmas time just in time for it to pop into uh, the new year's redcom we, we look at that uh, and usually uh, where, where there's been some uh, usage changes or international agreement we, we'll update those as well and provide guidance but uh, we so your range of questions can cover anything from sort of high level politics to uh, why where should i operate my latest q65 mode or something right so if uh, first slide so here you're going to learn a couple of things <laughs> so amateur radio has an unusual status. It is the only hobby regulated by United Nations Treaty. So when you look in your license conditions, the, at the top of the frequency schedules, it says amateur service and amateur satellite service. And those services, so, so it's, uh, well, whilst everyone calls us ham radio and what have you, at the very top level, it's uh, professional so just like there's the mobile service or the fixed service or the broadcasting service amateur radio is a service so, so it's got recognition at that top level and the ITU the International Telecoms Union which is the UN body 
every four or five years, we'll update its uh, sort of allocations at World Radio conferences. And uh, when one of those conferences conclude, all people present on the day, without exception, must sign on the dotted line what is effectively an update to the Master Treaty. So, so as I say, the, uh, whether we're on the winning or losing side is you know, by the by, but uh, at the very top, it is uh, the ITU's radio sector that creates a thing called the radio regulations, which have uh, international treaty status. Uh, from a local point of view, their origins date back to the Titanic tragedy. So before 1912, there were no frequency allocations. All there was, was a, a very short uh, protocol on how different radio companies would charge each other for their Morse code telegrams, which of course was how Mark Ernie was making its money in those days. And uh, they, they'd, they'd standardised Morse code symbols, which was why CQD was one or an old alternative and SOS was just being introduced. But uh, after the Titanic affair, the, uh, the next conference, funny enough, was held in Chelmsford, uh, sort of where, where I live. It was already being arranged, but it was held in Chelmsford. And that was the 1912 treaty is the first one where it's got defined frequencies, including the original 500 kilohertz distress frequency, which was obviously agreed as a rather high priority thing for some reason. In those days, the entire frequency table stopped at uh, around about 30 megs with an option for 50 megs. So concept of microwaves didn't exist in those days, sort of mobile phones didn't. So it was a much simpler era. And if you look on a bit of the RSGB website on the history section, you can actually see that uh, 1920s version of that table with a couple of amateur allocations and not much else. In recent times, of course, uh, what's happened is uh, the, the National Societies gather together under the IARU banner, and the IARU's got uh, sort of protocols uh, as nominally observers, but they're an official accepted body, both in ITU and also in CPT. So, so, uh, so in, in both those, which we'll talk about on the next slide, the, uh, over the years, of course, uh, amateurs have either been relatively lucky, but put in a lot, lot of hard work to acquire bands. So the, the peak amateur, you could say, was in 1979 with the Walk bands, 10, 18 and 24 megs. But they were all shared bands, which is why you're not meant to have any contests on them. And, and then in some of the more recent ones, the uh, 136 kilohertz, 472 kilohertz, interestingly, it was going to be 500 kilohertz, the Titanic original frequency, but uh, some, someone wanted it <laughs> in the end, so we had to move down slightly. Uh, and then in uh, warp 15, 5 megahertz, which, uh, as we know, didn't quite work very evenly out in the UK allocations, but uh, nonetheless, we, we got something. We... Uh, Going back a little while, the 7 megs band was expanded. Originally, it stopped at 7.1 in our part of the world, but uh, we got that up to 7.2. And in the last conference, and the pictures you see are from WRC 19 in 2019, we managed to harmonise 50 megahertz. So although we'd had the 6 metre band going back to the uh, 1990s, so when... Uh, you know, 405 line TV had disappeared. Internationally, it was still allocated to broadcasting. And in fact, if you were in Russia or other parts of Region 1, they're still on VHF. So uh, a key thing was to harmonise it uh, because if there's no international allocation, a lot of regulators won't give their amateurs a frequency. And so uh, 50 megs was quite important. So large parts of Africa and the Middle East, which are all part of Region 1, could uh, get their allocation. So uh, that, although that was in 2019, the, uh, there's a, usually a time delay before some of these things take effect at national level, but there's already a few countries on. So, uh, so that, that's on the positive side. Of course, everyone else who goes to these things are better paid and they've got a lot more money at stake than us. So uh, whilst the amateur volunteers are in the top picture, <laughs> and going to one of these things is quite an expensive effort, down the bottom, 
The other 3,000 delegates, and I kid you not, that is a single conference room with 3,000 delegates in, were uh, after lots of new mobile and satellite frequencies, uh, often uh, at our expense. So, so we get our fair share of uh, threats at uh, this level as well as, or European or national level as well. And uh, we can't stop everyone, but uh, we do try to uh, make the case that we shouldn't be forgotten. So uh, we haven't lost everything. We're, the UK still does relatively uh, well. There's, you do get differences at national level. So, so ITU Radio Reds, uh, it, you know, if you were on a boat outside the 12 mile limit, your frequency schedule or your license condition says, go and look what it says up in region one and you follow this. So it's not quite the same as the domestic uh, allocations. Five, five megs would be different. You wouldn't have four meters, for example. And in fact, until a year ago, six meters would be illegal once you're outside the 12 mile limit as well. So uh, that, that's why we do this sort of stuff so that uh, amateurs around the world, ideally can all be on sort of similar harmonized allocations without too many regulators interfering with us. Now, uh, the ITU only set the frequencies. They don't do other more detailed stuff. So if I come on to the next one, in terms of how, so, so you've heard where your wavelengths normally come from, but the, this slide covers how do they reach you? So, so as I said, the uh, ITU level, the, uh, they set the top level stuff. They also agree what your prefixes are. So that the G prefix, the M prefix, and the two prefix are uh, in the ITU master allocation series for all being owned by the UK. But they, they don't do anything about license conditions. Down at the next level, one of the great uh, important developments over the past, I know, 20, 30 years or so has been what are called the regional telecoms organization. So locally, CEPT is the, the one that covers about 48 member states. So it's not just the European Union area, it uh, even includes Russia. So, so all the Eurasia or continent, you, you could say. And uh, the Africans have their own one, African Telecoms Union, the Arab Spectrum Management Group. There's a number of these around the world. Uh, they try to obviously coordinate locally. So, so they've become, if you're out of WRC, they're, they're almost like block votes. So, so they, they don't always override a national preference, but they go some way to sort that out. And uh, there is indeed a, a European common allocations table or recommendation and uh, there, there are a few things in there that to our advantage. So, for example, the four metre band is set at the CPT level. So, so it may not have ITU status, but within a more localised region, you can have a local variation. So four metres is a very good example where amateurs have managed to uh, get in there. And uh, if you have at least 10 member states supporting you and not many objections, then you can get something in. Likewise, if, there's, if they all gang up on the amateurs, then, then you're in trouble. So that, that's on the frequency side. They, they do some generic stuff. They obviously do an awful lot of coordination for international uh, mobile telecoms. So the European Union's got very strong influence in that group, along with people like Etsy, the standards folk. And it's also the organization that sets and agrees TR6101 and uh, TR6102, which is otherwise known as HAREC, which hopefully you've heard of. So, so the syllabus for HAREC is set at set level. It's a bit outdated, but that, that's where it's agreed. And then uh, common recognition of license conditions or that exam standard is also in that European agreement, assuming that the, the appropriate states have signed up to it, which most of them have. So uh, that, that's uh, relevant. Uh, and then, of course, it comes down to uh, national level and our favourite body, Ofcom, who uh, aren't always the devils. They're, they're, they, in some respects, they're reasonably flexible. In other respects, they're not going to go out of their way because they don't get much money from us. So, so Ofcom like any national regulator, covers national usage and assignments. So not, not just parameters, but for everyone else. 
And if uh, they spot an opportunity to use the spectrum for greater benefit, they go off and auction it at uh, literally billions of pounds. So uh, we measure value of spectrum like they do in million pounds per megahertz or several million pounds per megahertz. So, so they've been clearing TV frequencies recently about 700 megs, not for the first time. Uh, and that may go for, I know, between five and 10 million pounds per megahertz because this huge high demand from commercial applications that are, if you design for it, are the same as you go around the rest of Europe because that's why your mobile phone works on roaming. If on the other hand, it, it's, a, it's a few megs that's UK specific, no one wants, then uh, I suggest you have a quick whip round because you could probably uh, buy it yourself. But you'd have needed a crystal ball to know what the result was. And so there have been a couple of lost opportunities there. But it's also that release process that's uh, given us a few slots where if you're a full license, you can get an NOV onto 71 megs or 146 megs or 2.302 gigs or above 275 gigs. So we do spot where there is low demand and Ofcom don't mind us experimenting because effectively we can show how uh, sort of low demand or wasted bits can be innovatively uh, used. What One day if we do too good a job they might say we'll have that back because you've shown how valuable it is but in the meantime it does let us have some fun. Uh, and south of the border in your case in the Irish Republic that uh, similar things happened in the VHF band area where, where they've got some extra VHF spectrum because for the moment, <laughs> might not last, but for the moment, the, uh, they've got low demand there. So the uh, Irish license conditions have got extras in the VHF, but when you look above 47 gigs, where you think, well, that's a bit high, who would use that? Amateur radio in the, the South it has got nothing, whereas we uh, have expanded quite a bit. Uh, and of course, those high frequencies are where all the 5G folk have been uh, fighting over, as well as down in UHF. So uh, Ofcom uh, also uh, don't just do license conditions and obviously issue our own licenses. They also do NOVs. So, so although your normal license conditions nowadays, thanks to one of our old proposals, don't say what mode you're allowed to use in the frequency schedule column, there are parts which uh, under NOV, now if you're a repeater beacon, gay, whatever, that they will very specifically assign you a frequency and uh, that, that's a bit different. Down at uh, RSGB level, we do our best to cope with all the levels above us <laughs> as volunteers, would you believe? So, so it, we, we obviously support collectively or to coordinate with our international colleagues in the uh, those uh, ITU and CPT or further abroad levels. I I'm not doing as much of that this year than I did a few years ago. I've got uh, another volunteer who's doing a very busy international work at the moment. I, I, I now if, if there's a usage change, what have you, I mentioned, we'll, we'll update the band plans. We'll uh, provide a bit of expertise into our exam friends because uh, the Spectrum Forum owns or has the strongest interest in the, the statistics. So the number of amateurs in the UK and how it's changing. And if anyone says it's an aging hobby, uh, we can have a discussion about that. But uh, so, so the statistics for all that comes under my side. But of course, uh, I'm always interested in how many new amateurs are being created by the exam system. So uh, ho hopefully more than the becoming silent keys. Uh, and we also provide some other operating guidance apart from band plans as well. Uh, and of course, the, there's a bit of an IIRU sort of linkage. So uh, someone mentioned a survey earlier. At the moment, uh, we're preparing <clears throat> both internally and further afield for the, there's a strategic workshop this autumn that IRU are coordinating on the future of amateur radio. And basically, not so much for our own folk, but you know, given the, uh, that stronger sort of competition, shall we say, from society and the internet, how we uh, go about uh, sort of creating or supporting the next generation of radio amateurs. Now, the survey you'll have seen advertised 
which we, we've had over a thousand people uh, send in reply, so it, it's had a reasonable take up. Uh, well, her, we, we just run in the UK. I know IRTS ran one uh, south of the border, sort of slightly earlier. And in fact, we, we talked to some of their colleagues in any case. Not every national society has asked it, but basically it was to uh, start with that top level question, you know, what, what's best for the future of amateur radio? And it started at the next level with, well, what are your current strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats? Now it's dead easy for people to whinge and say, well, you know, threats, spectrum loss, weaknesses, oh, this, that, and the other. It, sometimes it's a bit harder to think about the positives that, that you can build on or the opportunities so around, around outreach or exploiting technology. So we did that, although normally the, the results for that will uh, be wrapped up soon and go off to the next step in the IARU process. It, it, it's, uh, the answers have been so good, they'll be also used in more detail later in the year for, yeah, uh, RSGB's own update, because uh, if you're an RSGB member, there's a thing called Strategy 2022. So, so like most sort of wonderful organizations, so you have a five-year plan and our fifth year is not a million miles away. So, so we, this is part of the groundwork for uh, refreshing that. So on that front, we'll uh, just come to the final slide. So if you've got your wavelengths and from, for your spectrum and you've got some licensing and guidance sorted out, what you can do is create the House of Amateur Radio and its foundations, <laughs> if you take the pictorial view, are that allocation information from IETU and CPT down the bottom left. There's, off, there's extra stuff from Ofcom. So whether that's con license conditions, call sign policy or what have you, that's so you could say reg that's regulatory stuff. There's also technical conditions. So if you were a foundation licensee, for example, you, you might know that you're not meant to do too much home construction, but the, the technical stuff is in an interface regulation, which, which is lurking in your license conditions, which is another Ofcom document. Uh, and then there's other bits of UK law about you know, non-abusive content and uh, who's the Secretary of State and who's the emergency services, that, that sort of stuff. So th those all feed into your license conditions. Hopefully if you pass the exams, which Ofcom do have an overview on to make sure they're up to spec, then you'll get your call sign and you'll end up in the Ofcom database. And all I'll say is I hope you stay valid in that database. So make sure you're, e you're registered and your email address is up to date. And then you get gorgeous information about EMF and various other things. Uh, and if it's not in the conditions, which are sort of a bit dry reading, they, they do have guidance just like we have guidance. And I think they're updating uh, that guidance document as I speak, should be due out in two weeks time, I think. And between that, band plans, other operating advice and sort of opportunities to extend it with NOVs, that's what supports all these amateurs. So there you go. And there, there end of the slides. <laughs> so so I've, I've covered from, uh, you know, top international level down to you in three slides, as promised. That's great. That's great, Murray. Uh, Murray, we've had a few questions in. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm going to read a couple more here or uh, throw you with the first couple, about four or five here. And then we'll open to uh, anyone that's... Uh, uh, with us here this evening to ask any questions if you're happy enough. So notice the first one here on Twitter. Um, it was someone actually down south uh, in the Republic had noticed some aircraft scatter tests on the 40 megahertz bands. And a UK amateur came back and said, is it time to approach Allcom again about getting a UK allocation on 40 megahertz? What do you think, Murray? Is it possible? No. <laughs> and the reason I can be very categorical about that is that that's exactly what Ofcom have already said uh, within the past year or two. So, so uh, 40 megs is, uh, we, we do have one dormant beacon license because uh, technically we were the very first country to get on there apart from South Africa, actually. But uh, 
when we uh, obviously saw one or two other things, in particular the, the amount of spectrum down the south, where, where it was gifted uh, as a huge chunk, they didn't know what to do with it initially. They, uh, we, we obviously weren't, weren't quite as greedy and sort of went to Ofcom and said, uh, what are the, we, we asked them three questions. Uh, and this was in Radcom uh, before Christmas, if you want to go back. So I'm not telling you anything to you here. But uh, we, we first of all wanted to make sure there was still an opportunity to relocate the GB3 RAL beacon set, which, which is 40, 50, 60 uh, and 70. Uh, and we were a bit lucky because the people who had originally licensed it had left Ofcom. So, so we had to remind them that they had an obligation to still support a bit of experimentation. But unfortunately, no one's come forward to offer a new site for that. And then, of course, COVID got in the way as well. So, so we, we've not helped our own case, even just to get one beacon back on. But we also asked about either a 100 kilohertz slot or a second beacon. So, so very modest, but you know, comparable to what was said. Uh, and they were adamant, no. And, the, and it's got worse since. So... 40 to 50 megs, uh, I mentioned uh, 50 megs in WRC last time round. The current process, which will has already started and runs till 2023, is to reallocate 40 to 50 megs entirely for climate change and a number of radio astronomy and a number of other things. So, so there's- which, which just as you mentioned that someone else has asked, um to stand on the 40 meter uh, sort of topic. Was there any plans to harmonize 40 meters with region two and three from 7.0 to 7.3? Oh, I'll come so to that, yeah. The, that, so, so I'll just finish off the VHF one thing first. So, so in Ireland, uh, although they're, they're very lucky at the moment, ironically, they uh, also have a bit like the UK, a quite high priority on the climate change thing, but uh, they, they also, are the site for a low frequency radio telescope, which sits in 40 megs. So I'm expecting that to get protected as well as wind profile radars that point up and climate change detectors looking down. So, so it's not the best time to start something uh, new if you know that you've already, you know, once you get no, once you've already had a no, you are very careful before you ask the same question, question again, again, unless yeah. you've got a better idea. In the meantime, the uh, the, the current top item is uh, to make sure we don't lose the 23 centimetre band. So the European Commission is pr protecting Galileo, but it's not just them and that system. The uh, Japanese and the Chinese have also got sat-nav systems in the same band. So... We are spent, it, it's a good job there's COVID on because otherwise we'd have spent thousands on travel already as they're <laughs> piling into the, that frequency band where we got a lot of competition. So, so picking up on your seven megs one. So some years ago, as I mentioned, we got uh, to 7.2 uh, and given where we are in the solar cycle, uh, it, it obviously pressures the, the lower bands, but if when there isn't a contest on, <laughs> the, no, the, we can't justify the uh, demand. The, uh, the other snag is the broadcasters haven't entirely disappeared. So, so if you were in other parts of the world, particularly Ch China, Asian, what have you, the broadcasters still sit in there. So the... Uh, Although it's in the sort of long-term desirables list, until shortwave broadcasting truly dies, I don't think there'll be any new attempt on that one, as opposed to the uh, trying to improve our situation in top band, funny enough, is uh, if you look in your license, uh, there's only a small amount that's got a proper power limit on. But some of the systems down there, although they're government systems, the thing some of them have obsolete and disappeared. So, so I think the first attempt will be in a, a European attempt to do try that. To, can we gather ten to twenty votes to uh, improve our conditions down there first, rather than uh, go for? In, in fact, the the situation for HF, the the IAE spectrum policy is not to ask for any more spectrum for a generation because we are just bankrupting ourselves nearly trying to defend what we've already got 
and the only oh, exception to okay. that is up in the high millimetre wave bands, just to make sure we don't get squeezed out uh, too quickly, actually. But uh, yeah, it's defending where we've been is also effort. Sure, absolutely. So uh, obviously during uh, this last year, not only have we had COVID and everything else, but uh, this big thing called Brexit happened that was sort of went to the back of the media uh, list there. But someone has asked, uh, maybe within the ITU, when we talk about prefixes mm -hmm. and everything else, has there been any proposed changes to the regional suffix uh, as a result of br Brexit and the end of the transition period? And is Northern Ireland still remaining a part of the sort of <laughs> EU <laughs> FPS <laughs> zone? Uh, right, so, so, so the, the, the short answer is formally Brexit has and the European Commission have no impact because we're it's given by the ITU and CPT, not the EU. Uh, and, and I was absolutely fine with that, although the one subtle difference, or the two subtle differences are, one is on so-called CE marking, which of course uh, is a bit of a dual mark thing in your, your part of the world, but uh, that, that's neither here nor there because the equipment's just carried over. And then the, the only time where you will have to change a call sign now is if you used to be a reciprocal person living in France for a long while, they had a different prefix depending on whether you were European Union or non-European Union. So, so we've had one very odd case where the French, being the French, <laughs> uh, put us in the non-European. So, so because you get expats who live out there, and that, 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 so, so we know there's a half a dozen who've had their call signs changed uh, in French. They're, they're French call signs, but uh, not, none of the other stuff is need to worry you whatsoever. That's good to know. Good to know. Uh, okay. On the spectrum for 60 metres, we have differences between, again, the UK and the AI allocation. Oh, yes, yes. Probably because of the shared band and everything else with the allocation. But is there any room for developing a closer allocation of these two areas going uh, and going further, maybe other regions in Europe and that sort of thing? Right. Our, our key goal is, our, technically, we have more power and more frequency spectrum in five megs than the international agreement. So, so formally, the, the only bit that was agreed was uh, 15 kilohertz wide, as you know, 5355 to 5365 and a half, at 15 watts EIRP, whereas we're allowed 100 watts EIRP, but you know, we're, we're sort of scattered. Uh, and the, the reason for ours is those were the free channels that the MOD weren't using at the time. <laughs> and uh, the relationship with between Ofcom and MOD is not always perfectly harmonious, shall we say. So not too long after Warp 15, where the 5 meg thing was agreed, but our license had already been changed to lock in those ones. We, we obviously went to Ofcom and said, can we uh, have the gaps filled in? Because we, we were quite keen to fill in two little gaps, which meant that at least there'd be a common, you know, fully common thing for the SSB operators. Uh, and Ofcom were perfectly understanding of that and could, didn't really care. But they, they got a uh, bit of a no from the primary user <laughs> on the day who'd already uh, uh, been on the losing end so, so we left it for a few years but the, the topic has cropped back up and uh, we uh, the snag is you, we can't interact with people very easily in over zoom especially for those sort of sensitive conversations so we really have to get past all this stuff uh, and then we'll have another quiet conversation that you know sooner or later there will be another license review in a few years time a proper one not not like we've just had on the EMF uh, and we would hope to uh, fill in the gap. Having said that, the compromise is you might get a power cut and uh, lose a few channels in the process. So the, the balance is, you know, hold on to what you have or risk losing a little too much. We, we'd obviously like to retain a fair amount of what we've got and just fill in the gap. Yeah, but yeah. We are, if you are a Spectrum Forum member, a couple of, or groups such as the QRP group, for example, are on notice that we are prepared to uh, have a discussion with the primary user once he's in the mood for it. 
<laughs> so whatever you do, don't crystal it for some fixed channel, <laughs> is my which, answer there. Which, which sort of leads into the question I've sort of had for a while there. Um, every so often, you have this expression, especially over here in Northern Ireland, when it comes to two metres, use it or lose it. Yes, please. Please, please use the stuff. My question is, Murray, is that a real threat, you know, especially when it comes to two metres and other portions of the band? You talked there about if you ask a question, you might lose more than what you wanted to give away uh, and that sort of thing. But is that a real threat when it comes to our hobby as amateurs? If we don't yes. use, especially two metres or 70 cents, are we at complete risk of losing them? Right, so so we, we've had examples where we've already lost bands because they're in a really valuable spot, okay? So a fair amount of 2.3 gigs and a lot of 3.4 gigs went because it overlapped what people used to call the sweet spot for mobile phones. And so the, economically, well, there was no way you were going to hang on to too much there. But we actually did a remarkable job at clinging on. In, with bits that we could still use compared to others. Down in uh, two meters, there's uh, a couple of interesting examples. So as you know, we got to, and managed to retain the extra one megahertz, if you're a full license, 146147. Before we were granted that, Ofcom had their monitoring system, which does measure all the spectrum users out and uh, measured the occupancy of the two meter band and uh, so we turned up to this meeting and, uh, we they said oh we've been measuring your two meter usage <laughs> and we thought oh sh dear <laughs> politely <laughs> and it turned out that the uh, the graphs were showing that it was in 25 percent used the, you know all, all of it not not just the the, the, from 145, no, 144 to 146. And I thought, well, that's a pretty high percentage. And it was because the repeaters and data in the gateways were on quite high duty cycles, of course, particularly the digital ones. Uh, otherwise, uh, yes, the, the number wouldn't have turned out very well. And so we got away with it on the basis that uh, it had to be new or innovative because anything standard, you know, you've already got the spectrum for in any case. So that, that was the first time where two meters had been uh, sort of measured. So, so they, sure. the use or lose thing, pe people do measure. The, 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 there's constant monitoring of a lot of usage. Much more recently, of course, in the run-up, in the uh, summer of 2018, there was a big fuss over two meters itself, directly over it, courtesy of a French proposal to uh, put uh, new airborne systems in it. And uh, that got quite a reaction. Mm. And uh, I was one of the key people, along with about three or four others, who uh, wrote a very fast study paper for one of those set meetings, which said, uh, now, here, here's the uh, what we do with it. But here, technically, is uh, normally you spend four years, if someone has a frequency request for in a WRC agenda item, you spend four years doing technical studies are because you nearly always have to share with some of the services already there in addition to whatever the final rules are uh, and we thought we'd try and nick this one nick with this one in the bud well i think you probably know that if you fly uh, the little license exempt balloons on with two meter aprs or 70 sems aprs yeah. their, their reception range is excellent isn't it so so you can imagine that a 10 to 20 watt commercial transponder so it would cover a, a fair amount of Europe from uh, a high altitude balloon. So it wasn't standard aircraft altitude, it was slightly higher. Yeah. So, so the appropriate paper went in saying, uh, just one of these things all wipe out you know, X hundred kilometers radius and we're still primary user. So, so any newcomer's got to prove that they don't interfere with the primary user. And therefore the, you know, we, we were on the, the better part of it regulators had already had a need to say a lot of upset ordinary amateurs but we it just that sort of uncoordinated lobbying just doesn't always get you a winning thing because the, the the regulators say either what do these amateurs do we don't understand them or no 
Yeah, absolutely. They've done all absolutely. your houses because uh, they, they don't always want to spend time on us. But because we have sort of gone at it a bit more professionally as well, fortunately, uh, it, it got dropped. But that proposal was then altered. So it's in the band next door. So the aircraft band, the one near 137 megs and lower, has uh, funny enough got a, a digitization proposal in it. So, uh, and uh, the French who put that proposal in also had some microwave bands and that went on to become an agenda item. So, so even now we are still keeping an eye on those studies to make sure that sure. they don't creep back in by the back yeah. door. Well, it's funny you mentioned there, and someone has put in a, a, a great question, which I think is, is fantastic. You mentioned there about uh, spectrum use being measured uh, when Ofcom yeah. came along. So how is the spectrum use measured? And secondly, should everyone just start calling CQ test only frequently on many different channels to make sure it's all being yes, measured? Please, please don't. Please spread out because uh, we're, so when we were doing 50 megs, the, even though we've been using it nationally for years, the uh, Czech Republic, the French, and the Russians got their monitoring equipment out. And uh, it was deeply embarrassing because outside the narrowband segment, 50 megs is underused today, which is why we've replanned it. But uh, when we looked at uh, the paper, they'd... Uh, taken uh, the 50 megs IARU region one contest as an example of you know, reasonably strong activity day. F fair enough. But there was no sporadic key on that day. So everyone was on FT8 on 5313 and none of the rest of the segment was in use. So they said, well, you only need three kilohertz <laughs> rather than two megahertz. And, and that's what happened with five megs. The, uh, so someone said, well, we can only justify five megs. Go, go and, Five megs is quite a good middle bit where you get semi-reliable propagation regardless. So that, that's why that band's used by the military a bit. And the uh, I think the Chinese turned around and said, well, by our counts, you only need five uh, emergency comms channels. Five times three kilohertz SSB equals 15 kilohertz. Guess what ended up in the radio regs? So, so you have to be very careful about what you justify things for. So 50 megs is, was not justified, particularly on narrowband use. It was justified on some of this newer digital stuff, uh, including. Sure. Di so wait till you see. We, we've let we've got some very successful digital TV in 70 sems. We've got some of that was developed from that 146 to 147 area, which is obviously UK only. And now uh, 50 megs has been replanned in Europe for that TV and wideband data use. And uh, I would forecast that a part of two meters will get some wider band stuff in it, lower down in the all mode section. Because A, we should encourage innovation, but B, we want to get stuff spread out. So some of these slightly wider band modes are actually very helpful in this battle of us using it versus them measuring it. <laughs> and you know something, Murray? I'm as guilty as the next person when it comes to talking uh, in a QSO on two meters. Call in channel, then 525. Uh, uh, and well, you at find... least you're calling. A lot of amateurs just receive only. <laughs> and and a, lot, a lot of receivers don't make any noise. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can very much so go to the call in channel and just down 25 kilohertz or up 25, and that's where most people are. Yeah. Did you say maybe the thing is to spread out more and use a few more yeah. different frequencies? So Some people don't realise there's life outside the FM section. So if you were down the bottom in the narrowband section and named a decent Yagi at the moon, you'd get end up with a pilot because uh, th there's more traffic on EME than there is you know, outside of contest or activity nights or, on some of the narrowband stuff. So uh, moving back then to uh, 23 centimetres there, uh, Bob, G3, XOK asks, aren't smart meters creeping into the 23 centimetre bands? And are amateurs suffering from interference from these? So what can we do? Ah, no. So, so there are, I can't quite remember for Northern Ireland, but uh, certainly on my, our side, there are two bands. Well, there are a couple of bands used by smart meters. So 
Mid Midlands and south of England, effectively, uh, the, the, the local sensors may well use, say, 433 megs just to you know, give you a little display. But the, the interesting frequency is how it gets the results back to the electricity company. The UK is done wirelessly. And uh, in, as I say, Mid Midlands and south of the UK, that's purely done by the mobile phone network, nothing else. If you're in the north of England and Scotland, and this might apply over your way, they use some X tetra frequencies in 400 megs, so for long range radio. And then if you're in blocks of flats where the, there's a local connection difficulty, the exempt band in 868 megs allows one meter to piggyback and relay and mesh with another meter. So apart from the little display that you have in the kitchen, nothing is in our band at all and certainly not in 23 cents. And I've been in the meetings, so funny enough that smart meters is something that CPT, where when you get to the sort of smaller devices, whether it's Wi-Fi, smart meters, what have you, there's a group in CPT, which we were talking about earlier, which works out the technical regulations. Uh, and it's a group that amateurs sit on very regularly. That group, from an amateur point of view, we didn't have a, too much of an issue with that one, but I, I met the electricity engineers who were trying to sort themselves out. But uh, whereas uh, charging uh, cars wirelessly, so-called wireless power transfer, which, which you might have heard of, is in that group and has had a with amateurs and the broadcasters have managed to sort of slow them down somewhat in, in that group so where, where we spot you now emerging threats or technologies we, we we try to spot them early because what once they're in the field it's too late isn't it so, yeah. yeah sure sure okay well uh, uh if anyone has any other questions here you can now unmute yourselves if you want to ask uh, a question there uh you can stick up your hand or, or get attention you can ask Marie directly uh but just the last question has come into the chat there uh Galileo frequencies three plus four will cause some changes to our use of 23 centimeters Galileo three and four uh apparently it's going to start using <clears throat> the 23 centimeters any any thoughts on that uh, all right so so your your standard sat nav frequencies and Ga Galileo uses these the, the original GPS frequencies are outside the amateur bands on either side of the band actually L1 and L2 in 1150 and sort of 1500 or thereabouts but uh, Galileo was uh, for one of its newer modes when they uh, came up the, the 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 origins of this go back years but it took them years to get the damn thing launched and they went for a band at uh, normally 1260 to 1300 for a wide band waveform, which uh, doesn't just do navigation, it can do some other stuff. But that band is shared with the most critical air traffic radars, as well as amateurs. So, so 23 SEMS has got some massive radars in. And they are safety critical and obviously had to have priority. So the Galileo people who uh, wanted to put uh, stuff in orbit above those radars and followed by some of the focus, say, in China and Japan, were told that they can't transmit too strong a signal. Otherwise, the radar, the big radar antennas get flooded with noise. So, so they have to broadcast at a relatively weakish signal, still a primary allocation but weakish signal so that means if you've got a Galileo receiver which is really wide band with no filtering it doesn't take too much particularly from a say a wide band tv signal to uh, flood that receiver with noise hey presto <laughs> that there is a theoretical problem it then comes down to well how many amateurs are actually transmitting in 23 sems at any one time and uh, this is where my uh, microbe manager, Barry uh, Lewis, has uh, ended up being promoted to uh, coordinate all the, the region one uh, efforts on, on this area to explain all the different modes for amateurs versus uh, can we get some decent tests and decent performing receivers? Because no, we, we shouldn't go out of our way, even as a secondary service, to protect uh, inferior engineering. Now, of course, if you're living in a European Union country and your commission says this is our project, top priority, no matter what, then it's 
no matter what the amateurs say to their regulators, it, it's a bit of a hard ask because the commission's got a bit of priority there. Of course, for us, we're not quite as bound by that. And uh, as you know, the, the, the Brits may, may well have a rather different system in a different band. So, so uh, whilst we're providing a huge amount of technical expertise in the uh, regulatory effort, which will go on for a few more years, uh, the, uh, we're probably less affected, helped by the fact that uh, our TV repeaters have outputs above 1300. So, so when you look at your frequency schedule, the international frequency schedule stops at 1300. Ours goes up to 1325 and is used for TV repeater output. So the, the high duty cycle wide band stuff is outside the band. I think in the Irish Republic, the, the equivalent, although there aren't many TV repeaters there, they, they've got an unusual one that goes up to 1304. So, so again, the, no, either the regulators put ban on TV usage because it's the wide band waveforms that are the problem or you put them in a bit of the band that technically Galileo isn't. And if their receivers still get blocked by it, well, quite frankly, that's their fault for having the wrong poor receiver design. But yeah, it's our, IARU's top priority for the current cycle is protecting our usage in 23 SEMs. So it's a, it's a the WRC agenda item 91B. There's a piece of the RSGB website where for any given cycle, you can see what the agenda items are in some recent links. So, great, great. Okay, uh, Steve has a question here for you. Steve, go ahead. Yeah, good evening, and uh, thanks for letting me come in. Thanks for a very interesting night. Just a quick question on GB3 India Hotel in Ipswich, based on top of the uh, Ipswich Hospital. We've had a pulsing noise coming over. We've been trying to track it down for nearly a year now. And it sounds, it, it, it's a ch, ch, ch noise and it's coming right over the band. We can't track it down. We thought it might be paging. Um, the only other thing that we've come up against is, is uh, or across, is the um, weather stations that some of these houses have for weather stations. Has anybody ever experienced anything like this? We, we can't find it. And so, um, so what, what band's that repeater on? Uh, 433. Oh, right. Yeah. So, so in Ipswich, uh, one of your problems is you, I oh, know you, you're reasonably far enough away from Felix, though, which would give you some. Yeah. Yeah. We have got a paging system right next to the box, but it's it's been there for 20 odd years and never interfered with it. Yeah, but pa pa pages, apart from the old 439 pox hunt things, are in VHF and disappearing. But of course, there's all sorts of short range devices in uh, 433. Uh, some of those will just be simple building sensors locally and might be low power and you just need to get directional antenna out. The, the other great problem in 433, which are technically, they're not legal, but are noticeable in the country, is if there are any cranes or building sites nearby. So on the top of cranes, if you've got two tower cranes and you want to stop them hitting each other, they have a 433 sort of, I won't call them radars, but they're proximity sensors uh, and they pulse at oh. about a watt or so. So, so they're, because it's imported kit, it's often higher than it should be. And of course, it's, they're set very high. So you, you hear yeah. them from ages away. Because but, the coverage is, is basically right down to the Oldbrook coast, uh, up as far as uh, Pakefield. And, and can go south down into Essex. Yeah, well. but, but at 70 SEMS, uh, you know, it's not too difficult to get some portable uh, handheld arrow type antenna to try mm. and DF it a bit better. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. you, you just need some uh, cooperation from the uh, some of the more local enthusiasts to sort of DF yeah. it a bit. It's going to be uh, part the, of, a, of a DF hunt, I yeah, think. Yeah, so. the uh, lorry parks, container lorry parks, uh, can use 433 for some uh, tagging on their gantries as well. Right. Where, again, it's not a terribly high power emitter, but because it's high up in the air, it uh, yeah. sort of does yeah. carry somewhat, which is a bit unfortunate. Lovely. But, Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Okay, uh, Terry, uh, you had your your, yeah. your hand raised there. Have you a wee question there? 
Indeed, indeed. Uh, Murray, oh, you, you got it. Crane, de crane collision detection, I think, is the uh, term. That's we... one of the many plays yeah. in the 70 cents, that one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just wonder, uh, in order to promote a bit of activity, I wonder, like we have Whisper Light, um, you know, 50 quid's worth of uh, uh, um, always on Whisper transmissions uh, around the uh, world. Um, I wonder if there's uh, room for a, a kit which produces um, test transmissions uh, identified, of course. And uh, well, just... as you know, it's got to uh, sound like a beacon under your uh, standard licensing rules. In fact, when well, uh, I just, sorry, I was going to say um, it would be a digital stream, so it'd be quite wide band, and it would. Well, it, I don't wide care wide. about that. The license doesn't say anything about. <laughs> The nature well, of the signal. What, what I'm it's compliant. At, yeah, what I'm what I'm looking at is trying to generate some band occupancy for the uh, stati statistician. Statistic. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, you, you, you'll have to uh, ideally apply some of your uh, talents to a couple of the higher bands as well, where we're even more desperate, uh, to be honest. But uh, yeah, so so uh, interestingly, in the EMF consultation, uh, some amateurs pitched in with other questions and unfortunately the, there was another couple of cases of getting the answers you wouldn't have wanted so uh, one of them moaned about section 10 wasn't clear enough for beacons and uh, Ofcom's reply was in that case we'll tighten our guidance <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the the concept of a beacon is essentially a bit like a CQ call so that they're, they're uh, treated almost uh, under that category, you have to be very careful you're not breaking the so-called broadcasting clause, so, which is a different one. But uh, the uh, yes, by, by all means, uh, Whisper is a great example, but it's a very single narrow frequency, but of course the coding in it's great. It would be interesting to have uh, things that aren't Joe Taylor, to, to be honest, because it Sometimes there's great applications you can foresee, but if you just only wait for WSJTX next one, you'll never get it. So, so please be creative and code up something of your own. You never know. John, have a chat with John Reno, our VHF manager. He, he's very much into that sort of stuff. Uh, I wish my, my capability was uh, equal to the task. Yeah, well, Andy Talbot, G4JNT, uh, if you look at some of the reflectors, yeah. he, he's still trying to do that sort of coding stuff into but if you look in the you don't have ways have to do it from scratch if you look at what the uh sort of batc people have done with their reduced bandwidth atv that they we're, we're on the verge of putting full digital tv into t into the 10 meter band in only 100 kilohertz bandwidth in fact i think they've run as low as 33 kilohertz so it's astonishing that you should be able to adapt to something standard like the MPEG standard, which, which is what they're doing, but do it at much lower amateur friendly data rates. And of course, everyone's got their SDR. The, the, the codecs are free. So, so it's funny enough, although these ideas have come out the 146 band, our, our latest reforms not only uh, created a, a new play area in 50 megs, the 29 megs bit of 10 meters has been uh, also set aside for wideband experimentation as well. And uh, the, the original TV stuff was QPSK based stuff, so more like satellite standard, but that doesn't do very well on propagation. So, so if you've got a, one of the things we're trying to encourage developments of is a sort of OFDM type waveform that can cope with terrestrial fading and propagation a bit more as well. But uh, yes, you're, you're welcome to, uh, so reach out to, you know, whether it's the TV group, the satellite folk, or a lot of the innovation, which has now moved down into HF, originally started with Joe Taylor trying to improve his EME score in VHF <laughs> and UHF, if you look at the history of it. And, and look at where it is now. Yeah. Uh, great stuff, great stuff. Um, anyone else have any questions there uh, for on the spectrum? Um, I think... Would it be true to say, uh, Murray, that in the UK in particular, when it comes to our spectrum allocation, we're are we are we well off compared to others? 
I think, oh, yeah, it's a bit swings and roundabouts in places. So up to HF, ignoring that sort of strange bit around 60 metres, we're as good as anyone else, at least on the frequency allocations. Don't, don't mention power levels, because <laughs> the <laughs> Ofcom are quite conservative on that, as you've noticed recently. In uh, VHF, we've done a bit better. We're, we're, unless you're in Africa, where you get four megs at six metres rather than two megs filling up because it's a bit big, big and empty down there. We, we've managed to cling on to 2.3 and 3.4 gigs, whereas uh, if you're south of the border there, they've got no nine centimetre band, and I mentioned they've got no high millimetre wave bands. Where, where we've uh, been restricted, but one area we would like to uh, do something about is in five gigs. So uh, a lot of amateurs think they can go off and adapt five gigs Wi-Fi. And uh, so whether that's for mesh radio or some other things or digital TV centres, uh, and uh, if in doing so, they, they nearly always break their license conditions because the Wi-Fi channels are wider than what the amateur allocations are it's broken into three different little bits so so one area we want to do is to liberalize in fact this that we want to do this all the way down to foundation level if you're trying to attract new amateurs if they come from the hack space and make affairs in that area they've been dabbling with bluetooth wi-fi and what have you and, and whilst it's exempt that's fine and, and then they come to foundation and they only get 10 gigs and still no wi-fi allocation that they get, if they progress, they, they go up further and they find that, uh, all right, they get 2.4 gigs, okay. But at five gigs, it's still all this fragmentation. And, and you don't get that in other parts of Europe. So, so there's some, that, that's the bit where we're a bit worse off, but we hope to fix it at low power. Above that, we're better off than nearly all the other countries. So, so we've hung on to the useful bits of 2.3 and 3.4. The, uh, we, we, we got a bit back at 2.3 because we spotted that the uh, Home Office, years ago we, we lost 2.300 to 2.310, and uh, that which is why narrowbands at 2.320, uh, uh, but we spotted that in an auction that no one wanted to buy the bottom two megs. So, so when we were losing the other bit, we said, well, as compensation, if you <laughs> gave us NOV access to this bottom bit, which is too narrow for you to sell, it could be very helpful. And uh, hey, presto, they went and did so, which was fine with the moon bounces. And then, uh, funny enough, inside the megahertz, it was another case where they updated the uh, digital TV standard to fit inside. And that, that was good for them and mitigated the loss. It sort of spurred innovation. Ofcom went away happy, and certainly we did. We couldn't believe our luck. And uh, well, in the last cycle, the 5G folk came along. And uh, although they still need for long rural range, the, the, the normal UHF and mid-band frequencies, there, there was a huge fight over anything above 24 gigs, all the way up to 70 gigs. Now, the wavelength there is that big, you know, the, the range is modest, but if you want in a sort of busy football stadium, really high data rate transfers or that sort of thing, the, those millimeter wave bands are you know, ideal for it. So, so we were quite worried about this, and uh, when that cycle started, for 47 gigs, which is primary, primary amateur exclusive, was in the list. So uh, sort of five years ago, Ofcom quickly said in the meeting, can you explain to us what you're using this 47 gigs allocation for? And you know, the number of users at that point was uh, not, not that many. But nonetheless, there was a bit of innovation in there, including uh, some moon bounce experiments, would you believe, as well as some clever beacon stuff. So, so we, we wrote a white paper and uh, hey, Presto, hey, they went way happier that we could actually answer a question on the spot. <laughs> B, we got ourselves onto the, the Ofcom managed delegation. So if it ever cropped up again, you know, at least we could quietly, because we can't speak up how to turn, but uh, at least we could head off uh, any other stuff. Uh, and of course, the channels that people wanted were so wide that our little allocation wasn't that useful in the end in any case. So, so great, uh, and great. more recently, the in the RSGB AGM, we, we have you know prizes for various innovations each year, don't we? 
And uh, this year, the uh, F Fraser Shepherd Award, which is the top microwave prize, went to mainly some Australians who turned 122 gigs into mass production parameters. So, so a band we had literally abandoned and wouldn't even recommend because it's a very high loss band due to an oxygen resonance, happened to be a band that uh, the next generation of car radar sensors, well, they were gonna use, uh, which is a good band for it. Uh, and uh, where well, you only need, I know, 50 to 100 meters to see the next car in front of you. Yeah. So, so li little single radar chips, get, getting chips to work at those frequencies is incredible. But nonetheless, uh, a company called Silicon Radar did so. The Australians adapted it. And uh, between the Australians, lots of others, they come up with some standard circuit boards, job lot, uh, and it's been a bestseller. So even at sort of really high frequencies where you'd think, it's unusable, people have already made progress. And uh, Ofcom, very, very similar. We said to Ofcom, there's nothing above 275 gigs. Now, uh, you, you'll never have an interference problem. Would you uh, give, give an NOV out for that? And uh, although we've only had a, literally a handful of guys who are capable of doing that because they've got the test equipment, which, which is always a key problem in those bands. Nonetheless, they, they went off. The antenna gains are incredible. So you don't need much power, provided you can point your antennas accurately, you, you get kilometers, you see, as if it's not raining. So, so on YouTube, you'll see our amateurs at 288 gigs. Uh, and that, that's right back to the spirit of amateur radio, you know, technical investigations, you know, progressing the hobby. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and, uh, and it goes back to that 1906, the creation of the radio regs. The reason the radio regs stopped at shortwave was that no one considered that VHF was any use, and they were like amateurs play with it. <laughs> Murray, um, you know, repeating uh, ourselves. <laughs> I found this evening really interesting, uh, and you've answered a lot of questions that I've always uh, wandered through my head. Uh, and who can I ask this question to? The likes of the the Spectrum Defence and everything else. And I, I guess I would say. I never realised like your team and a group of volunteers actually do so much for the spectrum in the UK. And uh, as amateurs, I would say everyone watching this and everyone was, would, we really need to thank you for the work that you and the volunteers do in representing us because there has been uh, commercial people cut off from the point and white papers released and everything else. And I don't think maybe it's time the RSU maybe started bringing the Spectrum group more to light to realise that they are doing well, something. We have you know. a surprising amount of material online, including a video and stuff, so, so we, we, we try our best. So Spectrum sounds a bit of a dry word, but when, when you look at, as I presented in just three slides, spec from Spectrum to licensing to usage, that, that entire thing co covers uh, quite a scope, doesn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Which uh, where, where I think uh, a lot of people don't realise uh, the work that uh, you volunteer and your group of volunteers are actually doing. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and we can only do it by uh, convincing Ofcom, uh, yeah, because they're our national regulator, to support us on some things, or not not to be. <laughs> so not, sometimes not they'll just say amateur radio is low priority, <laughs> and they'll stay neutral. But provided they don't take a uh, an against position then, then we're okay uh, and we but it you can see how it relies on cooperation with you no know, member societies all around the rest of the region as well because uh, when you saw that international meeting picture the the the, the amateur team there was from all the continents so uh, absolutely so uh, on behalf of us all this evening can uh, I, and can I just ask a question or not ask the question but just mention something that Murray used to torture my head about. Absolutely, of course. A year or two ago. Validation. 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 Ah, yes. I did give out cream eggs two years ago around Easter time when you were torturing me about getting people to revalidate. Murray, but, if, but they not... spoke to me, if they spoke to me about revalidating it, I think it was the Lagan Valley Rally in 2019, they got an Easter egg, a cream egg. <laughs> That's right. I remember it was part of the, the persuasion, you know, uh, if you revalidate, Philip will give you a cream egg. And it worked. It worked. 
Didn't it, Philip? We'll, we'll have to try that on a national scale. That <laughs> certainly does. Certainly does. All they well, have to do. I, I like cream eggs. You, I've missed out there. <laughs> not just as big as that, Terry, but on the way to the rally, I bought a box of. It was the time that Dave Wilson, who was president at that stage, came over, and we had the Ariana A. <laughs> Radio Amateurs Unbelieving Blind Club over to you. So I just thought, well, the only time people ever come to our STB stand is to take the sweets and whatnot. So I thought, I'm going to buy a box. I bought a box of cream eggs, and they were only allowed a cream egg if they would let me ramp up them about revalidating their license. It must have and had I, some effect. I, it did, but we kept that whole campaign up for about a year, Murray. And I would still say there's probably quite a few out there that haven't revalidated it recently. Yeah. Yes, it, it's not quite as bad. But, so, so we knew back then, which was why we were having that discussion there, Philip, that uh, there was something coming down track, uh, uh, which it did, which was that EMF thing. Uh, and uh, the other thing was the how Ofcom call sign policy has been moving around, where if a call sign stays invalid for more than two years and cools off, it can be taken uh, at least a full call sign can be taken by another applicant. So uh, yes, it, it's important for various reasons to keep your sort of information up to date on their online system. Now, of course, in the uh, recent EMF thing, the uh, Ofcom did obviously attempt to email everyone who was listed in their database. And uh, when they trialed that a few years before, we knew the stats on returns were atrocious. Absolutely atrocious. Oh, not not just your regional efforts. There, there were a number of reminders in Radcom and a few other things. But uh, with COVID, uh, Ofcom said, "Whatever we do, please don't go too high profile because the, not everyone can do it online. There, there'd be quite a temptation for them for some folks to ring up the Ofcom help desk in Warrington, which of course wasn't terribly well staffed <laughs> at the time." But nonetheless, we, we, we get the impression that uh, a lot of people must have improved their email addresses from the successful rollout of the conditions, actually. So we, we, we'll be hopefully getting an update on what the latest state of play is. In, no, Steve, Steve Thomas, who's RSGBHG sort of liaises with uh, them. We, we, the, the, the figures, no, you, you obviously can't expect some silent keys in that database to do much, and, and there are some. So uh, we, 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 we improved the information on the RSGB website and in a, in a few channels, not just for revalidation, but also for families contacting Ofcom in a silent key situation, because we're just as keen for them to, whichever way we do it, with our priority is to get a, an up-to-date database sure. that, that's ultimately for our benefit. There's more than enough call signs in it already. We, we have more amateurs per head of population than a lot of European countries, would you believe? Fantastic. So, which, which probably the, the remote invigilation over the last uh, that, pandemic that's, has uh, really helped, helped to absolutely. Mitigate things, yeah. Stop uh, bombing yourself up, Dave. Uh, uh, really but the problem, um, Terry, the problem is, there are still people who hold three call signs. In the EMF consultation, there's a promise of new guidance, and the Ofcom. Uh, is increasingly of the view that, a bit like the olden days, that uh, as you progress, that your lower call sign should disappear automatically, ideally. That it doesn't at the moment, but the, the, there's an encouragement for going back to that sort of idea, I think. You, the, they, they've also spotted some uh, sort of artificial clubs being created as well, shall we say, very <laughs> small clubs. Uh, and that shows in the statistics and the, the you know, not, uh, their new database, I'll, I'll tell you one thing, their new database has got fantastic analytics behind it. So, so unlike the old database, they know exactly what the picture is. <laughs> so they know I hold five call signs so. though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, although it's a bit of a game with FOIs and what have you, if, uh, People ask the right questions. Uh, or, or, yeah. They'll get the right answers. Yeah, Terry, you had your hand up there. Have you a wee question or? Uh... Uh, no, that's it. I I hit the wrong button. But it, was, <laughs> right. it was meant to be a thumbs up and thanks ever so much, Murray. Very good. Yeah. So so yes, call, whether it's so call signs is always a topical one. The uh, 
for you know so whether it's spectrum allocations you know lo local policy issues or what have you there's uh, always stuff going on you know as soon as we'd finished that 50 megs item in fact before it that conference had ag agreed the agenda for the next two cycles almost so so we've got agenda items heading out all the way to 2027 Boys, it so, is. so that is why uh, and some of that will be right over the top of amateur stuff again so so that is where we're very much in you could say more defensive mode rather than acquisition mode where whereas because you can see the agenda you can sort of start fighting back against it now oh, before yeah, it ha having up. that early view is whether it's from a technical point of view or whether it's from a regulatory point of view so early intelligence is not knowledge is power but knowledge is re really helpful but then on, on, <laughs> on the other half, I presume, trying to get something on the agenda, you're going to have to wait a while as well. Yeah, so. yeah. So, so to get 50 megs on, we, uh, in fact, we had three options because I was in a meeting, I think, in the Isle of Man in the old, so, so about, uh, in fact, the new agenda has already been talked about. No, normally you do it about six months before the conference. But we had, th funny enough, there were three options. Uh, and to satisfy all the interests, we, we had an option for top band, funny enough, an option for 3.4 gigs and an option for 50 megs. So one HF, one VHF, one UHF. Uh, and the only one with the strong case and the fewest objections was that 50 megs thing. And that was because there were some uh, closet amateurs sitting in other national delegations. So certainly Ofcom wasn't going to take a position on it, but uh, they, they didn't mind us having a bit of a go. But uh, yeah, it, the WRC, uh, as I mentioned, 190 countries, it, because it's consensus, you need unanimity. It's not a majority vote. There, there is no voting. You need unanimity for 190 folk to support an agenda item. On 50 megs, we got some of the strongest support, not out of Europe, but funnily enough, from the African and Middle Eastern countries who knew that STEM skills from amateur radio was vital for their future youth. There so, we go. Uh, there we you go. go. Interesting. You, you, you have to find friends in interesting places sometimes. Murray, again, can I thank you for taking the time uh, tonight? Uh, it's been really great to get uh, teeth into the whole question around the spectrum on what the RSUB is doing. Uh, I find it very enjoyable. So, again, thank you very much. Yeah, and, okay, my uh, pleasure for taking the time out. Uh, don't be rushing off anywhere. Uh, but um, if you are watching us on YouTube, hit the like and subscribe, and we'll be back on again on the second Tuesday uh, of uh, June. And uh, we'll see you then. So again, thanks very much for joining us. And Thank catch you, you later. Thanks for being back. Cheers all.